we're talking about the war on science. It's a topical, topical subject given that in our current presidential election we have at least one party that has basically eschewed the use of fact checkers deciding that facts really aren't relevant to what they're doing. My guest tonight is Greg Layden. He's a, an evolutionary anthropologist and a science blogger blogging at National Geographic's uh, science blogs. The name of his blog is Greg Layden's blog. And as an evolutionary anthropologist, he has been involved in the war against science for a good long time. Welcome, Greg. Thanks very much. I should point out I've been on the good guy side. Yes, yeah. yes, very much so. Um, well, and I suppose our topic kind of begs the question, is there actually a war on science? Yes, there is. And it's actually one of the longest running wars that's been going on. It actually dates to the beginning of science. We all know the stories of people coming up with important new ideas like the earth is round and not flat and so on. And they get in trouble with the church uh, and so on. But the, the, the current war in science really has its deepest roots in, in the evolution creation debate. And that goes back to the beginnings of evolution. In the very first days that geologists were saying that um, the earth had strata, that there was great antiquity, that there was change through time, that the same species that exist now did not exist eons ago. Uh, natural historians, natural theologians who were religious accepted that. They, they believed that facts were important, that truth was important, but a subset of them didn't. And they uh, started the first denialist campaigns, the first science denialist campaigns, uh, taking um, you know, there were people in those days in the 19th century who, who would say, I know the majority of scientists believe that the earth is old and that the strata show change through time, but there's always a few scientists who disagree with that. And there were. There was a famous guy, named, not so famous guy, but a guy named Price, I don't remember his first name. He was an amateur geologist who looked at, at the geological record and didn't understand it and thought it was all jumbled up and made no sense. And he claimed that there was no way geologists could put the framework that they were developing on these rocks and fossils, that it was just wrong, they were just making it up. And he was like the climate denialist of today. He was denying the validity of geological science and the, the religious establishment that didn't want evolution to be true or the antiquity of the earth to be true pointed to him and said, see, we have a guy on our side. You know? And so, yes, that, that's, that's the, the beginning of the modern war in science dates to Darwin's day. So, as you pointed out, facts are kind of important. And we can see that science has uh, advanced our health, advanced our standard of living, advanced all sorts of things. Um, you mentioned religion, and that's probably one, but what kind of reasons are there to oppose science and the conclusions of science? Well, the, okay, yeah, religion is one obviously large one, just to underscore that a bit more. If evolution um, demonstrates that key features of the Bible are wrong, then that's a direct attack on a, a religion based on the Bible, and it is conceived of as such. And especially anyone who has a more literal interpretation of the Bible will need to fight against science for that reason. Um, but there are other reasons too. I was, like, I was thinking about it on the way down here today. Imagine if, you know, just to establish one fact, it's, it's pretty clear that President Kennedy was killed by this guy named Oswald acting alone. We now pretty much know this is true. We knew it then too, but there were a lot of conspiracy theories that came out at the time. Interestingly, when you talk to young people today, they often assume that there was a conspiracy because they've heard so much about it, but they don't care. The Kennedy conspiracy theories didn't go away, they just became uninteresting compared to modern day issues. But imagine if it was in the interest of some very wealthy people and very wealthy corporations to make everyone not know it was Oswald acting alone with a gun. How much more would have been put into that? How many more? All you have to do is find the people who are, who are, who are supporting and developing the conspiracy theories and just make sure they get funding and a little bit of credibility here and there and just and encourage them. And in a way, that's what's happening today the, the, the main reason to oppose science generally today is if you happen to be a very wealthy person or, or a very large corporation that would prefer that people were confused about science, that would benefit from people not accepting a certain science. And that's, of course, what's going on with global warming, climate change, which may, we may want to talk about is the, um, uh, if you're in the oil industry, you might be, you might not be, you might not be against the, you know, I don't believe the guy who owns BP or Exxon is an anti-environmentalist. I don't believe that they don't think that climate change is real. I don't believe that they don't have a way to make money off of climate change. It's just that their interest is in making sure that everyone stays confused and that there's always a debate so that they don't have to be, have their policies and decisions driven by consensus. All right, so when it comes to creationism, to step mm -hmm. back in history a little bit, um, the obvious uh, culprit there it would be the church is are the differences over creationism versus evolution just a matter of religion? 
<coughs> yes, they pretty much are. Uh, the, the, and and we, we know this because any, any two ways of thinking where more information is coming in and being employed will evolve and change. Okay, it doesn't matter um, what, you're, what, what, they're, what, uh, the, what we're talking about. Any, any two broadly different perspectives on how to do something will change, both will change over time in relation to each other and in relation to the new information coming in, even if they're opposed to each other, even if one is right and one's wrong, they're both gonna change. If they're, can, if they're developed by people who are seriously thinking about what they're doing and, and taking the new evidence and using it. There's nothing, I brought a, a prop today. This is a, this is a, 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 um, a pocket watch. And the pocket watch has an interesting story. You know, Bishop Paley wrote about the pocket watch. He wrote about walking through the forest and finding a stone and not questioning its natural origin. And then finding a pocket watch, looking at the intricate design and the finely tuned machinery inside of it and so on, and, and assuming that that was a, not made by a watchmaker would be absurd. Yeah. What's interesting here is that this watch was actually found by my uncle in the forest in the Adirondack Park when he was going in, uh, hiking into a fishing area of his that he liked, and he was a Franciscan priest. And when he found the, stop, the, the, the pocket watch in the forest, he probably assumed that it was made by a, a watchmaker and not by uh, natural processes. But he, being a Franciscan in the 1960s, probably didn't think that that was an argument for creationism. He probably just thought it was cool that he found a watch. But the, the, the argument is that th this, this watch is proof of a watchmaker, just like the complexity of design in an organism is proof of a creator. That argument was made in the 18th century, sustained through the 19th century, and it's the same argument that is made today. And There's been no change. So as we talk about that, we're kind of getting into uh, the version of creationism called intelligent design. Yeah. And is there really any difference between that and the more standard forms of six-day, 6,000-year-old Earth creationism? Yeah, well, that's what's interesting about it. I think that if you ask intelligent design proponents today uh, what they think, they would say, yes, it's new. It's, it's scientific. It's a new theory. It's proven with mathematical theories about reducible, irreducible complexity and so on. But it really is the same exact argument that was the initial creationist argument. It was the intelligent design theory of today is Paley's original theory. It's a theory that emerged as a counter to emerging thinking of the antiquity of the earth and the, and the significance of the geological column and eventually evolution. And it's the same. Uh, the the, the uh, six day thing, the, the um, uh, what we call young earth creationism, <coughs> but that's often thought of as a different form of evolution today than, than evolution, than, it's different than intelligent design, but intelligent design has actually always been there. And uh, young earth creationism is something that came out of American fundamentalist churches sometime around the time of Clar Clarence Darrow and the, and the um, Scopes trial as being um, a version of creationism. So that's actually the, new, the newer version of creationism that has come and gone. And as I believe P.C. Yes, Meyer has pointed point. out in a recent talk, it actually comes out of Seventh-day Adventism, which would shock and horrify a number of the people who accept it today. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about a war against science. When it comes to creationism, who's winning? What's the current state uh, of the war? It, it's a stalemate, which, which makes me think sometimes that actually the creationists are winning. Because you would think that in the modern day, it, you know, it, it's interesting that it, okay, the, the standard line that we now understand to be, that most people will tell you at this point, is that there's been a poll done on a regular basis for the last many years by Harris that asks people the same basic questions every time. There's been a few other polls that support this, which show that about half of the American population are creationists and about half are a mixture of weaker creationists and evolutionists. Now, if you actually ask people the question, if you start off by asking people the question, do you accept or do you think that it's probably true what, science, what scientists say about the evolution of life, do you think that's probably true? Most people, 75% of people or so will go, oh yeah, probably. If you start off by saying, do you think that the Bible is basically correct? About half of Americans will immediately say yes, no matter what the next question is. Okay, so part of the problem with the Harris poll is the way that the question is asked is always gonna get the same answer. As long as there's a certain number of Christians out there, you're gonna get the same answer all the time. Um, nonetheless, even when you probe more, you do find that we're not seeing a decrease in belief in creationism. And if you look over the longer term, the last several decades, I think we saw an increase in the 50s and 60s. So they had an increase and haven't really gone away since then. Um, 
I suspect that we're going to see a shift in the other direction over the next few years, because, simply because fundamentalist Christians have become a little bit too extreme, I think, for their own children. We're starting to see more people. I think you know, the latest polls are showing a, a greater number of people who don't count themselves as religious. They're coming from somewhere. And I think that they may be people rejecting religion, and they may be rejecting creationism at the same time. But, but really, all the work we're doing is resulting in, on the ground, not changing people's minds. But we, are, we have won in another context, and that is we've won in the, in the courts. We wonder where it really counts. You know, it doesn't matter how many people believe that abortion should be accessible or not because the courts have been clear. It doesn't matter how many people think creation should be taught in the school. The courts have been absolutely clear on this. It can't be taught in a public school. And we've won. We've finished winning. We're done winning. Have there been any changes since the anti-intelligent design verdict in Dover? Changes in, in public... In the court... In, in court uh, there's cases. been what's happened what's happened lately is a new pattern which is uh, school boards are, are, are no longer a place where you see a lot of uh, creations popping up as much as you used to except for in Texas where it's a statewide thing um, and uh, you don't see you, don't, you see fewer fights going on in school school administrators are more aware of the fact now that they're going to have to lay off teachers and not build a new gym if they do if they get into this fight because they'll lose the fight and there'll be big court costs. Cost. So they don't, they don't do that anymore. What's happening now is it's shifted to state legislatures. And the state legislatures are probably aware of the fact that they can't win either. But they can get their constituents to like them if they propose amazingly bizarre bills that require creationism to be taught in schools or somehow uh, uh, change the way that, that that's teaching is done in public schools. Uh, these bills never get passed or they get tossed out after they are passed. And that's the change, is where the fight has been playing out has moved somewhat. And I'm going to give you an opportunity here to plug the NCSE, because if people come across this kind of information, they need to know what to do with it. Yeah, the National Center for Science Education is an organization that's been around. I, I encountered them. I knew about them because the person who's the executive director was actually a, uh, a colleague, in, a biological anthropologist like I am. And... Um, and we had a lot of ties. And when she went off, and I knew that she was doing this interesting project out in Berkeley with creationists. And one day I was actually um, invited to, to debate some creationists on a radio show. And I thought, sure, I can do that. I'll win because I'm right and I'm a biologist and stuff. And so I, uh, somebody said, you ought to contact Jeannie Scott over at the NCSC. I said, yeah, hey, I know her. Yeah. So I contacted her. And the first thing she said was, Greg, you're an idiot. Never say yes to a debate with creationists on a radio show in the Panhandle of Florida, <laughs> which is what I had done. Um, and uh, th anyway, they, the NCSC is, a, is the place to go when you want to know about the fight about creationism versus evolution in public education. And lately, they have actually added and significantly ramped up their involvement in climate change related teaching. Which is an excellent opportunity to say, what's the current state of the war in climate change? In flux. Okay, with, with evolution and creationism, the same kind of poll done again and again gives us the same results for many years. In the question, for example, do P, does the average American believe that global warming is happening and that it's caused by human activities? First of all, the same questions are not being asked. Polls are all over the place as to what they ask and, and where they go uh, with the questions. So we can't compare polls as easily. But that has been, uh, dramatic changes have happened in, uh, over several years. And just a few years ago, uh, we saw a uh, fairly, number, fairly large number of, of, of Americans believing that global warming was a kind of a hoax. And that number dropped and dropped and dropped, and then it went up again. And it went up because of significant uh, efforts on the part of anti-global warming people to make it go up. Uh, and, uh, but then it's gone down again. And what's made it go down is over the last two years, we all remember last winter being pretty mild and last summer being pretty hot. But you might not remember, I think it was two summers ago, you know, it was a very hot summer. And, um, and then last summer, the one we're just ending now, the, uh, the Arctic ice essentially melted off. Greenland did some really scary things with its ice. Uh, four years ago and three years ago, there were major pieces of icebergs floating off of the, of the south, southern continent. And then we've had some very severe storms, starting with Katrina, which is several years ago now, and going through more recent storms. And uh, as a result, people are changing their minds. And I just read a poll this morning that showed, compared 2009, 2009, 48% no, 2009, 13% of Republicans, Republican voters, thought that global warming was real and caused by human activities. Today, it is 48% of Republicans and 87% of Democrats. So that's a difference. That's a, huge, that's a sea change in people's thinking about it. 
So it's dynamic. And it could go back the other way in a couple of years. If we have a couple of, we have a no significant major weather, freaky weather in the next couple of years and enough rhetoric coming out of the global warming denialists and nothing else happens. If a volcano goes off and it cools down, you know, uh, which could happen, um, where we may go back to everyone not believing in global warming because it's actually nice to not believe in global warming because it's really kind of a horrific thing when you think about it. It would be really nice if it wasn't true. Although this week we're not really able to not think about horrific weather right. with Sandy having hit New York City. Um, any sense of what that's doing to people's thinking on? Yeah, there's a major, uh, a major change happening in people's thinking there. A couple of things. First of all, it just happens, and this is really a coincidence, but it's kind of nice. That just a couple of months ago, a, a paper was published that said, let's look at what happens with global warming and sea level rise with storms in, with storm surge. Let's take, I don't know, the battery in New York as the place to measure the sea, the sea um, uh, rise. So they, they, they used the lower Manhattan, the battery, the tide gauge at lower Manhattan as, this, as a data point and predicted what would happen under several different scenarios of global warming and different storms. The storms they imagined were not the storm that happened. The storms they imagined were coming straight north, different trajectory. But when it comes to a rotating storm, it doesn't matter as much if you're going slow, it doesn't matter which direction, which direction you're coming on. You sit there and you're spinning counterclockwise in New Jersey, you're still gonna do the same thing to New York that Sandy did. And the prediction was exactly what happened with Sandy. Um, <clears throat> Sandy was a 500 year event. What this paper suggests is 500 year events are going to happen every 25 or 30 years on average. So the fact that that paper was done, this crazy outrageous idea that there would be a 25 foot surge in the Arthur Kill and a, a 14 foot surge in Battery Park and so on. And that dozens of people would be killed and the subways would be flooded. It was absolutely outrageous. And this paper was ignored. It just happened to come out and nobody really paid much attention to it. But if the global warming denialists had gotten a hold of it, they would have made fun of it, they would have ridiculed it, and then of course, one day, it happened. And the other thing that was about, about Sandy that's very important is that Sandy was probably the second storm of its kind that we know about. The first one being one that came out the, the, around the same time of year, the so-called perfect storm or the October storm. The one that the movie and the book called The Perfect Storm are based on. Uh, very similar, a couple of storm systems, including a hurricane, combined. In the case of the perfect storm, the hurricane vanished into the storm sooner but then this large storm system actually spawned another hurricane. It's one of the few hurricanes known to, to form in the North Atlantic spontaneously. It was never named because they don't like to name them when that happens. Um, and uh, but this was a bit different, but it's the same size storm hitting a similar area. The perfect storm hit Boston and this hit New York. Um, so we've had two of them. We keep records for a long time. We have good satellite records for th over 30 years. Um, we have a new kind of storm that happens. And, and another thing that is not demonstrated yet, but you know, the way the Earth system, climate system works, is a certain kind of organization that should happen to the atmosphere. That only happens to a certain degree because the atmosphere isn't stable enough for it to be developed. But if you added energy to the atmosphere, you can get this organization to extend outwards from the equator. And that organization involves air masses in the Arctic that would block systems going north. That could be, that's, that's why we had some of the last, weird weather we've had in the last year, this blocking formations that might become normal. And that's what caused this hurricane to go north and turn left and start, to turn, start turning right. Um, if that becomes normal, this kind of thing will happen every five or 10 years, or every six or seven years. The other thing that's different is that um, people, I'm, I'm per, on a personal crusade to make this stop. And that is when scientists sit there and, and it, like, just like this and say, the following. You can never say that a given storm was caused by global warming. Okay. The next question that comes to my mind is when did you stop beating your wife? Okay. It's not really a valid question to ask. Was this storm caused by global warming? Because think about it. What that means, the corollary to that is, can you name a storm that's happened in the last decade in which the energy used in that storm included zero energy from the added carbon to the atmosphere? Okay, which gallon of gasoline that you put in your car were you driving with just now? Okay, there's, there's really not a valid question at all. And it, it turns out that, you know, global warming has contributed to every storm. It contributes to every rainstorm. And it contributes to every drought. It contributes to every weather event because it's just part of the weather. And it, it may be that we have a qualitatively different kind of storm going on that has happened. But it, it, 
it, it doesn't matter if it's not qualitatively different. The point is that uh, it, there's probably going to be more, bigger, and farther north large events. And it, it isn't any longer, it, it hasn't, it's been true that global warming's effects have been known for years. By the way, if you look at a map of, of where the extra warming happens on that planet, it's not uniform. If you look at a map of where this extra warming occurs and where it's occurred over the last, say, 50 years, it's really interesting that the North Atlantic and North America have largely been left untouched. The first, the, if you look at the last 50 years or 40 years, the first 30 years of that or so is all in Africa, various parts of Asia, a few other parts of the world, not in North America. And suddenly it's happening in North America. One of the most interesting things global warming denialists say is, uh, if you mention a big storm, the 38 storm, the, the last time the barometric pressure was this low in, in, in New York was during a 38 hurricane, 1938 hurricane. People will hear that and say, aha, it happened in 38, see, then where's your global warming? Because somehow in people's minds, global warming has to be something that started in 1990. But we've been burning coal since the 18th century, and we've been burning it a lot since the mid-19th century. And we've been throwing in gasoline and diesel since, since the beginning of the 20th century. So we would expect the effects of global warming to start showing up throughout the entire 20th century. And so all of our storms have been you know, increasing in frequency, increasing in size, increasing in how far north they've gone. And it's not possible. It's sort of like saying, uh, you know, there's a new designer drug out there and everyone's addicted to it, so there's a lot more muggings where people need to get cash to buy their drug. But you can't say a single mugging was a result of this change in the society. But the fact that the number of muggings have gone up by 600% might be important. Right. Yeah. So you identified energy companies as a source of the denialism yeah. on climate change. Um, if you look at particularly um, political actors who are involved in this, it looks, however, as though there's also some sort of religious component to this. Is that true? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to look at the religious component of, um, first of all, if you're looking at this from the point of view of, uh, you know, of evolution damaging your, your biblical literalism, and then you really want to do damage to science generally. So anti-global warming is good anti-science strategy. Okay, so that's one reason why there's a marriage between um, global warming and related denialism and evolution-related denialism. Another reason, though, is because both of these things exist within the Republican Party, the right wing, various large-scale entities, political entities in the United States, which have both big business interests and religious components. And that it has to do with where the religious right decided to place itself. If the religious right had decided to place itself in the Democratic Party instead of the Republican Party when they went ahead and decided that they're going to take over a political party a few decades ago, we might have a very different situation now. It might be that the, that the Republican Party is where you'd find more atheists, more people who are not science denialists, um, yet there might be some significant problems that people would have with corporate interests. Which is also a bit surprising because if I was a guy who owned a big energy company, I'd be selling you windmills today. I mean, like selling you oil yesterday and windmills tomorrow. I mean, why not? You know. So speaking of anti-corporate forces, um, the other very large denialist force on the um, on the scene is the anti-vaccination force. And you want to briefly, because we're running out of time, maybe talk about how that might be a little different from yeah. other kinds of denialism? <laughs> well, it's actually, and, and this is an area, I'm getting into an area that I don't, I'm not very much of an expert on, a, a vaccination um, denialism. I haven't really done battle with them or tracked that too much. But uh, this is, and I, I, would, I would say that both, anti, as far as I can tell, anti-vax thinking is not aligned with the religious right, specifically. I mean, there are plenty of li little religious groups who don't like any kind of medicine and so on, but your average anti Vaxxer is a person who may actually be politically progressive or, or disinterested, and they may or may not be religious. And in fact, I think there's more overlap with, you know, pe people, people get drawn into the vaccination thing either because they have kids who are autistic or they see that sort of thing going on and they've heard that there's a connection. Um, to me, I see the anti-vax thinking as coming from the same place as people believing other things about their children's illnesses and what to do about them. Okay, um, when Huxley was born, before Huxley was born, we had you know, this sort of group of parents always getting together to talk about you know, how to have a kid and stuff like that. And I found it very interesting that of the, of the dozen mothers in that group, some six or eight of them claimed that their child was allergic to milk. Now, hardly anybody is allergic to milk. 
but yes. Right. For, uh, hardly anybody. Um, and and it, it, because that means you're allergic to certain proteins, it doesn't mean you're lactose intolerant. It means you're allergic to certain proteins in milk and you can't drink milk or you get very sick. Their kids had bad gas, okay? But milk allergies were, considered, were blamed and it actually led to some of them giving up all dairy products, which included giving up eggs in their own diets so that they wouldn't pass dairiness onto their children while breastfeeding them. And I will call everybody's attention the fact that you just said eggs. Eggs, which are not from cows, they're from chickens. So um, in other words, people, when, they're, when your baby is crying, you want to do something. And not only do vaccines link to potential diseases in my people's minds, I mean, in other words, in a negative way, but you also stick the kid with a needle and make it cry. You know, so I think that the anti-vax thing is more of a parenthood thing. It's not linked to a, a, a religious um, motivation and it's not specifically science denialism. And also there might be some overlap with sort of natural foods and natural life ways thinking, which is all very nice in some ways, but also often very unscientific and often anti-scientific. So very briefly. Which brings us to GMOs, but we're not gonna talk about that. What other <laughs> kinds of science denialism do we need to be on the lookout for? What do you see coming? Yeah, I, I, I see <coughs> a big problem right now, uh, emerging, getting, beginning bigger, is probably that over the food supply. And I think we have to get very serious about that. I think that science denialism over the food supply is bad because we need food. It's also true though that people who are scientists and science oriented using, you know, involved in the food industry have to understand that some of the things they're asking people to stop wanting, they can't. So it's, it's, it's not okay to say, oh, if people want meat, we'll give them meat because they have a preference for meat, but not say if people want things grown without, for, without insecticides, that that's not okay. All right. You know, people want natural foods. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, and thank everybody at home for uh, watching. I'm Stephanie Zavan. This is my guest, Greg Layden, and we are with Atheists Talk. Uh, this is the most recent newsletter for the Minnesota Atheists. If you are interested in getting a free copy, go to the Minnesota Atheists website, minnesotaatheists.org, and request one. We will send one out to you for free. And uh, as I said, this has been Atheists Talk. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Zavan. And if you're interested in us, we're interested in you.